You're listening to the IFF TV podcast. Hello, Market Irish Football Fan TV. We're back again with our season previews. We're on to Sligo Rovers. I'm joined by Mark Halton. You may recognise Mark, he's host of EJ Menswear's sports podcast, I would say, The Changing Room. Mark, do you want to tell us a little bit about The Changing Room, who you've had on and stuff like that, and where people can fo- uh, follow you and, and listen to your shows? Yeah, I suppose, first of all, you'll find us over on Spotify. We post it on Facebook, obviously on YouTube, all the normal places. Um, it was a concept, I suppose, we came up with in the first lockdown. It was something, sorry, it was something we had planned before the first lockdown, and I suppose we went with it then. Um, we kind of held back then, obviously, the whole Instagram Live thing took over. We kind of pulled back from it, and it's something we kind of relaunched, I suppose, the last couple of weeks and months. Um, we kept the episodes a lot shorter. I think at the start, it was a lot of maybe like a This Is Your Life episode and looking back on the career. So it's more kind of current topics and stuff like that. So we've been fortunate. We had Jack Byrne on just after he signed for Applewell. We had Richie Towell just recently, uh, Aaron Mack and Neff. Um, so it's it's heavily soccer based um, because it's Kevin me Gordon doing well. well yeah. Doyler was on a few weeks ago as well. That was brilliant. It's 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 nearly all football to be honest, because uh, that would be that would be my desire. Uh, we do branch out into a couple of other things. We have Dara Keenan on today, who's a young jockey from Sligo, just made pro. Um, and I think next week we're doing one with the UFC fighter who's fighting the next big night. He's actually his father is from Sligo. So uh, we branch into different stores, uh, sports. There's a couple of GA and rugby fans around the shop. It wouldn't be my area of expertise. <laughs> oh, that's, that's really cool because I've seen some of them and they are really good. Obviously, you got Jack Byrne before anybody else, well, which was obviously a massive cue for yourself. So uh, obviously, you're user, user building quite a nice team there in terms of um, relationships with the players and stuff like that. So long may that continue. Um, guys, get over there, check them out, uh, and also follow uh, EJ Menswear on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, the whole, the whole shebang, pretty much. The whole shebang. <laughs> well, we said we get you on anyway. Uh, you were one of our very few people got in touch with us to do a Sligo Rovers uh, podcast. You were the main man, so here you are. We're going to talk about Sligo, we're going to talk about last season, I suppose, just to start off with Mark. Um, very, very shaky start. I mean, it was... I don't think he's at any points going into the lockdown. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, look, last season was, I suppose, a roller coaster for everybody. The, the way it started, Paul, um, I suppose Liam was very unlucky. We had a, an awful lot of defenders out for the start of the season. I think John Mahan obviously got seriously injured in pre-season. Uh, Lewis Banks was out. We had a, a real makeshift back four for the start of the season. We actually went into kind of the break or, or pre-season fairly positive. Romeo Parks obviously had to go back to the States with the, with the visa issue. John Mahan, as I said, suffered a serious injury. So we kind of went in on a little bit of a lull at the start of the season, missing players and stuff like that. So, yeah, the start of the season was tough. Um, we were we were quite happy to see, uh, come, see lockdown come, I suppose. And just, you know, people have kind of told us about the... The work the volunteers were doing there at Sligo and stuff like that to keep, keep the, the club afloat and stuff like that. So do you want to tell us from your own point of view how, how that was and were you involved in that? Uh, no, I wasn't involved in it myself. Um, the likes of uh, Jerry O'Connor uh, in Sligo, uh, massive, obviously massive Sligo Rovers fans. I think Sligo Rovers is, is belonging to the town in Sligo. Anyone that comes to Sligo knows that it's a real, real football town. Um, obviously, the lockdown came and financial worries, I think, struck I'd say nearly eighty percent of the eighty percent of the clubs and um, the bitter red trust as they do every time they rally the troops, they set up the fund. I think um off the top of my head, I think there was about thirty thousand raised in the first twenty four hours. Don't quote me on that. I'm nearly sure it was something like that. And then the end figure I think was in around a hundred thousand or something like that. It was it was absolute madness. Um there's no doubts when the chips are down in Sligo and um, we we get behind them. But again, the bit of red trust uh, to give them a shout out here, Jerry O'Connor and, and all and all the, the the men and women involved with that, they're absolutely unreal. I I just I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's because I'm an Everton fan and I absolutely adore Seamus Coleman, but I seem to yeah. have a soft spot or soft spot, sorry, for uh, Sligo Rovers. Just you know, there is that obviously affiliation between the two now, and uh, and I actually was involved in, in a cycle a few years ago. Um, basically, a group of people from Everton in the community cycle from uh, the showgrounds to Goodison Park. They stopped off at Daily Mount Park. I was kind of helping out in that. Uh, I didn't actually do the cycle because obviously it was Goodison Park 
or from sh- from the showground, sorry, yeah. to Goodison Park via the ferry and stuff like that. So it was all big, big cycle. So and they raised sixty thousand pounds for the Everton in the community as well. So it always seems to be that link with uh, Sligo and Everton as well. So I think in that sense, it kind of gives me. A sense of just wanting to see them do well. They seem like a really nice run club. The people within the club seem like nice people. And um, I've never really met a, a Sligo fan that wasn't a nice person. So uh, yeah. we're going to keep you that trying going. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, come here, tell me, after COVID, I mean, to finish up where you finished up, you couldn't have foresaw that. No, I suppose, look, when it came back, uh, obviously the, the money that was raised, we, we put it to good use. We brought Junior in. Um, I suppose he was brought in to score goals to keep us up. In the end, he actually he didn't score that many goals, but that doesn't kind of do him justice. He, he kind of played wide left um, and he was brilliant. In fairness, Jason, if you're anyway organised with set pieces, you'll score goals because that fella, he's the most, he must be the most foul player in the league at times. I remember being kicked to the ground, so he was brilliant. Um, coming back after lockdown, all we wanted was to stay up, to be honest with you. There was a genuine fear um, of us being relegated and it just, it wasn't, it was not worth thinking about, but it really, really wasn't. Then suddenly things changed. Obviously, we had a chance to get players back. Junior came in, Ryan De Vrij was just after joining, maybe just before lockdown. And, and a couple of lads kind of found their feet. I think we went on a run of, I think, five out of six. And suddenly you're looking at Europe and it was just an absolutely crazy turnaround. Um, it wasn't without its ups and downs. I suppose we were pushing for Europe. We kind of we had a couple of blips. I remember there was a couple of bad games. I think away in away in Waterford, um, we had a bad result against Waterford. Shams, I think I remember against your own team in Talca Park was probably one of our worst performances last season. That was that was a dire dire match for us. Um, and I suppose we had lost hope of Europe in a sense. And we might have got a wee bit ahead of ourselves as supporters. Suddenly we were, we were disappointed, you know, but we were safe. Um, and I suppose that really kicked home then. And obviously results went for us in other places and we, we got, got it kind of back together. And suddenly Europe was on again, getting a couple of good results. And suddenly you're, you're heading down to Oriel Park on the last day of the season um, looking for a win to get into Europe. I think there was a, a bit of a bad a chance missed up in Bally Buffet that night. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, I still don't know how, how we done it, but we got into Europe and, and not just for the buzz of, of this season and hopefully getting the chance to travel and, and welcome the European team to the showgrounds, um, but just the pure financial uh, security that, that it provides. But you know yourself, it's it goes without saying. Yeah, but I'd say you, you must be absolutely delighted like with the turnaround because, as you mentioned there, you know it was real genuine fear that you were going to get relegated and then you go and finish in the European places. I mean, I, I, for, for yourself... I'm delighted for you. As a Shells fan, I, I wish that goal had went in in Bally Buffet, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But listen, um, your players out anyway for this season. Um, is there anyone that you may kind of be feeling down that they've left the club? We got Kyle Callum McFadden who went to Kingsland Town. Will Seymour went to Finn Harps. Ronan Coughlin went to St Pat's. Uh, Luke Nicholas went to Finn Harps. Uh, Junior's gone to Dundalk and Ronan Murray's gone to Drogheda. There may be someone missing off that list. That's from Andrew Yeah, uh, Ronan, Ronan Murray has gone as well, I think. I think um, I think with, with Kyle, Kyle was a great leader. Everyone was sad to see him leave, leave the club. Um, in terms of, I suppose, what people would consider the bigger names, Junior, Junior was brought in, I suppose, to keep us up and score goals. He didn't score the goals to keep us up, but he was certainly, as I said, he was a massive part of it. I would have, um, I would have liked to have seen him stay. I think he's going to be a very, very good addition to, to Dundalk. I think he, he has all the attributes, holding the ball up. He's strong. I think he's one of the best in the league at taking the ball into his feet. Um, he can just, he's brilliant at it. He's so strong. He's quick. Um, probably had to do a job for us on the left to accommodate other players. Um, from what I know he'd done it without any fuss at all and he was brilliant um, in terms of Ronan Coughlin Ronan's a player that kind of divided opinion uh, in Sligo he, he had a great start uh, when Ronan's good he's brilliant uh, at times when he was bad it, it kind of it was in reverse he was brilliant dropping deep getting the ball when he was on song we played well but I suppose I was sad to see him go but I don't think anyone at the same time shed too many tears yeah, well, I actually thought he was very, very, very good and obviously very reliable from the spot as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think the, probably the one criticism you could throw at Ronan, and this is coming from I'm a fan of Ronan, I think his work rate was was absolutely phenomenal. As I said, in terms of dropping deep and linking up play, I think that's his strong point. I don't think he's not a natural, I would say, goal scorer. I probably wasn't enough room for him and Romeo coming back this season in terms of, I'm though I'm sure we probably tried to keep him, I, there probably wasn't enough room in the starting eleven for the both of them considering how, how we may line up. We just want to take a quick break to speak about our sponsors for this video and podcast, Team Fipe. As you can see in the image there, some of the clubs that Team Fipe has acquired, Shamrock Rovers being the main one so far. Team Fipe is an easy to use online payment platform that covers management and administration, finance, club development, communication, governance and COVID track and trace. Club administrators save hours of time with Team Fipe, save time on administration and finance. You can quickly confirm, decline and record attendance at club sessions and events. With a new database created, parents and players register with the system which in turn creates and builds a player database for the club. Team groups can be easily set up for easy access to data. Real-time transaction updates. Team Fipe keeps club administrators or team managers updated on processed payments but also flags up incomplete transactions and automatically emails the payee to give notice of a future attempt. Team Fipe already works with over 1,000 leagues, clubs and academies and are growing all the time. Team Fipe is proud to be helping clubs across multiple sports. Team Fipe is free to use it's free to install by all of their members. There are no hidden fees, there is no sign up fee, no annual fee, and no monthly membership fee. The processing fee Team Fipe charge a very modest fee for any financial transaction that they process, similar to the bank or other credit card processor fees. Book your Zoom demo today at teamfipe.com or call on plus 353 1526749. Yeah. Well, I think we'll just talk about the re-sign before we get to the transfers yeah, in anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. So the re-sign for, for next season are John Mahon, David Cawley, Niall Morahan, Ed McGinty, Luke Nick, Luke McNickness, sorry, uh, Mark Byrne, Ryan DeVries, Gary Buckley, Romeo Parks, Johnny Kenny, James Robinson, Scott Lynch, Lewis Banks, Scott Lynch again. Sorry, he's there twice. Uh, John so Russell, in it twice. <laughs> John Russell, Darren Connells and Regan Donnell. Yeah. So uh, those... I- so those players, sorry, um, who who is the most excited that you have you are to kind of keep around? And is there anyone there that's re-signed that you, you know maybe promote from the younger ranks that you're excited about? Uh, I suppose John Mann. Uh, I think he's probably one of the best. I wouldn't I wouldn't say up and coming because he's around a couple of seasons now. John is absolutely brilliant. He's strong as an ox. He's quick. Uh, he actually has had a bit of despair with the injury. I think John is going to be one of the best centre halves in, in the league for years to come. Uh, Niall Morhan. Um, he's probably going to play an even bigger part this year. Middle of the park, he's absolutely brilliant. He, he, you could actually just watch him on the ball all day. He's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, in terms of some of the, I suppose, the younger players coming through, there's a lot of hype at the minute around young Johnny Kenny. Um, he's done very, very well in the underage scene. I don't know if you remember his father, uh, Johnny Kenny Sr. He's probably one of the biggest legends in Sligo Rovers history. Uh, he was a, a nippy winger, obviously. This young lad is playing up front and I suppose he, he scored goals already and people were kind of wondering, is he going to get game time in the first team? It's hard to know. He, he's taken his chances so far. I don't know if you've seen his two goals the other night, but they were yeah. cool, cool as a cucumber. I think it's easy, it's easy, Paul, when a player comes on the scene, if they're a defender or they're a midfielder or if they're even an attacking midfielder or whatever it is, it's easy to nurture them and, and try to not throw them in. But... If you have someone, no matter what age or they are, they are, if they're putting the the ball in the onion bag, it's very very hard to ignore. So I'd be very excited to see how Johnny goes on this year. Uh, I think the lad who assisted the two goals there, like Mark Byrne, he looks he looks very promising. Uh, McCourt has played a couple of games at left back. From what we've seen, he's been he's been brilliant as well. So yeah, no, very happy with those. I think Johnny Kenny, Johnny Kenny, Niall Moore, him will be the two probably main ones for me. Um, I'd have to throw in Lewis Banks as well, Paul. Um, I think on his day, honest to God, there's very few fullbacks in the league as good as him defensively. He's absolutely brilliant. And I haven't seen anyone really roast him yet. Um, so, yeah, I'd have to say they'd be the picks for me. Yeah, we're just gonna, you spoke there, obviously, about Robbie McCourt. I thought he actually was really good for Waterford last mm-hmm. season. And, um, 
you know, he was playing centre back then as well for for Waterford last season. I remember he played a game in Talca and he was brilliant. Like he's not obviously a massive size or anything like that, but just his football brain is quite good, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, we're, he looks like he can play in a couple of positions across the defence as well. So I think we're fortunate. We do have a couple of defenders in there that can kind of play all across the, the back four. Lewis can play either side. I know Regan, Regan Donnan, who's re-signed as well. Uh, I think Regan's in his, his eighth year in the showgrounds for a young man as well. Um, so he can play midfield. Gary Buckley actually settled into the back four absolutely brilliantly last year. Um, he, he was terrific. And if you speak to anyone around the club, a lot of the younger players, they speak so, so highly of him. I think we could potentially see a good partnership between between him and John Mahan once they, they get a good run at it. So plenty of competition for places. Um, particularly this year, Paul, I think we kind of, maybe last year, we, we carried a couple of players who were very injury prone. I think the club were quick to address that this year and they brought in players, you know, who, who have, would have a good record in, in terms of fitness. Yeah, we're just going to go to the players in because we just mentioned uh, Rob, uh, Robbie McCourt there. you got Greg Balder from Shamrock Rovers, who's a really big player. Shane Blaney yeah. from Doncaster. Jordan Gibson from St. Pat's. And then you got Walter Figueroa from Derry. Richard Brush from Cliftonville and Colm Hogan from Derry. Now, I had a Derry City fan on with me the other day and he spoke about Figueroa saying he has glimpses where he could be unbelievable and then there's large parts where he's not so it's kind of sounds similar to what you said about Ronan Coughlin earlier on and then Colin Morgan he thought was actually really good on the right side of defence and he gave him that balance but I don't think he played as much as he probably expected him to so they were just two off there that spring to my mind there. and obviously Greg Balger I think he's a great player yeah excited about Walter obviously look it's going to be interesting to see what he brings um, it, Romeo that could be kind of that could be kind of aimed at Romeo as well that in times he does it in glimpses and and in stages. Um, I would think with Bolger coming in, probably the most exciting sign. And I interviewed Greg Bolger a couple of weeks ago for the club, and and there's absolutely no, no doubt he's not here to to see out his career. I didn't know what to expect when I met him. Um, he is he is fairly determined. I think he'll add a little bit of steel steel to the team um, that we might have. I wouldn't say lack last year, but maybe we just could have done a little bit more of. Maybe when Kai left, it's a young team. Um, David Cawley probably would have been one of the older lads. Uh, uh, Buckley, they provide a little bit of experience, but I think the likes of the likes of Greg coming in, it's going to be worth its weight in goal, Paul, and that's both on and off the pitch. Particularly with the likes, the likes of Niall Moore and these lads, he, he's going to help them so much. Um, I was really, really impressed when I got chatting to him. Uh, Walter, again, excited about him. McCourt, Gibson, from what we've seen in, in glimpses, of course, pre season, not pre season is pre season, but I don't remember going into a season the last couple of years where the fans in Sligo have been so positive about the signings we've made. Um, we, we we can't wait, to be honest with you. I think that's, you know, Liam Buckley, I think he's he can be trusted with transfers, do you know what I mean? And um, I think Greg Balger, he brings a level of professionalism to the squad that maybe they didn't have previously, um, maybe when Kyle left, as you say. But I think uh, with with Greg, you look at the clubs that he's played for in recent seasons. You look at, you know, the Cork team he played in, winners. Uh, you look at the Rovers team and who he was around in in that professional environment day in day out. And although he was injured, he was still a key part. Jack Byrne still raves about Greg Bolger and did when he was playing with him in his first season. So I, I think that's what you're getting there. I think people might not see what he does because he's pretty much a kind of holding midfield. He breaks up play, but he's also he's also like a voice on the pitch that you need. He's a captain, he's a leader. And for me, I, I actually think he, he's a massive signing that he's kind of gone under the radar a little bit. You know, people were talking about Aaron and Jack leaving Shamrock Rovers, but not many people mentioned Greg. I know he was injured towards the back end mm-hmm. of last season, but he definitely helped the likes of Gary O'Neill slot in there as, as, as that defensive midfielder there. And he's arguably one of the best in that position now, you know? Yeah, I think from speaking to Greg, um, the one thing that came across is that, you know, he's not here to, obviously, as I said, he, he's not here to see out his career, but helping those young players, it's it's going to be essential. I think I think there was a couple of pictures of him arguing, arguing a, a, and falling out with players in a good way, even after a couple of sessions. So, no, we are very, very excited to have Greg on board. Yeah, well, just, we usually finish off on it like a, like a position previous. So, where, where you actually would love Sligo to finish and then Lastly, where you actually think they they will finish? Okay, um, I'd say I'd love us to win the league. <laughs> it's been too long. 
Uh, I think I'd love us to see us win the league. I'd love to see us. I think there's going to be, obviously, look, the Dawkins and Shamrock Rovers, there's a lot made of how strong they are, I suppose. There might be a little bit going on around the dock. No one knows if they get their act together or not. Um, I would like to see if, if one of them starts to slip up a bit. Obviously, it doesn't look like it's going to be Shamrock Rovers. I would love to see us put on a good push to maybe push towards second. Um, that's obviously w- with the with the heart. Um, with the head, I think Europe, I think top top four again, Paul. Um, and I wouldn't be a side Rovers fan without saying uh, a day out at the Aviva. Yeah, and, and and obviously a decent run in Europe as well will be Absolutely. a successful season. Yeah. Well, look, even as we said earlier on, Europe speaks for itself, Paul. Financially, if you can get through the first round this year, it, it's set up for the club to make to make money, at, which is going to be needed, obviously, with the loss of revenue from match day alone and stuff like that, and kind of fundraising and stuff like that. Even though, as I said earlier on, the trust will get behind them. So Europe is going to be Europe's going to be essential. Hopefully, we get a good run in Europe. Take. You know, top three. We say top three, and uh, our uh, our yearly trip to the Aviva. I don't well, think it's been a few years. Sorry, what was that last bit? I it's, thought you'd it's, finished. It's been a few. It's been a few years. We usually uh, we had a nice run of getting to the cup finals there from 2009, I think 2013. So hopefully we get back there again. Yeah, I don't think you're being unrealistic in, in in what you're looking for. I think a top three finish is realistic. Again, it's going to be down to so many different factors. And I think um, a lot of it will kind of play out in the second half of the season. I think with the, tr- the transfer window then and stuff like that and see what happens there. Because I, I think Richie Tell is going, supposed to be going to Shamrock Rovers and there'll be mm. other deals, I'm sure, struck out between now and then. And it would be interesting to see because, I, as you mentioned earlier at the start of the show, Sligo added players, you know, to help them obviously after COVID and stuff like that. So it will be interesting to see kind of the tail of the second half of the season. But I think what's key for Sligo is to start the season strongly this time around rather than last year. Yeah, and again, as I said earlier on, Paul, a big thing for us this year is how the club have gone about their business. Um, we did carry a few players last year that were probably were injury prone. We seem to have a good fit, strong team this year. Um, no major injury doubts, I think, going into the start of the season, which is strange for us. We've had serious injuries going into the last couple of seasons. So, no, uh, we're, we're very positive that down this neck of the woods. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, right. Well, I think that's it, Mark. I want to say huge thanks for coming on and having the chats with us about Sligo because we're trying to get every club now and we nearly managed that. So, uh, huge thanks to you for coming on. For people who uh, may be looking to listen to the podcast, you want to give it one more plug uh, just before we go? <laughs> Yeah, the changing room by EJ Menswear, you'll get it over on our Instagram page, our Facebook page, you'll get it on YouTube, and you'll get it on Spotify. Make sure to check it out. Don't forget to leave your thoughts in the comments on everything to do with Sligo Rovers from this video. Do you agree with Mark? Do you disagree? Let us know where you think Sligo will finish. Don't forget to like the video, and don't forget to subscribe. We'll speak to you all soon. Thanks for watching.